Okay, so first we're going to talk about this idea of randomization and why it's so important when you're trying to find causal effects um, in the real world. Um, and so why we care about this is related to the fundamental problem of causal inference, which we've talked about a lot in the past couple sessions. Um, this fundamental problem is essentially this right here that you cannot observe individual level effects. Um, ideally, when you want to find the difference, here's this lowercase delta here. Um, if you want to see the causal effect in an individual, you have to measure what would happen if they were in the program, and then measure what would happen if they weren't in the program, and subtract that outcome. But in real life, we, can't, we can only see one of those things, um, and so we can't find the individual level causal effect. So the alternative, because that doesn't work, is we have to take the average. So that's what this fancy formula here is. This y bar just means average. And then p equals 1 means when the program is 1. So this formula, we can read it as a causal effect is equal to the average outcome given that the program is 1, or given that the program is on, minus the average outcome given that the program is 0, or average when the program is on, average when the program is not on. Um, doing it this way, finding an average treatment effect for a whole group of people, only works if the two groups, program equals one and program equals two, basically look the same. You can't have one group that self-selects into the program and one group that doesn't because then your comparison is not going to be accurate. But as long as program equals 1 and program equals 0 looks about the same, the people who are in those two groups, um, on a whole bunch of different characteristics, same age, same income, same gender, same whatever, um, then your causal effect will be um, kind of more reputable. Um, so this is um, what we saw in the World Bank reading that you had today. You have some sort of population of eligible units, whether it be people or households or cities or whatever, um, and then you randomly assign this population to treatment or to control or comparison groups is what the World Bank calls them. And as long as you have big enough samples and well randomized assignment, then your, um, your average treatment effect that you calculate in this randomized control trial will be accurate. Um, because notice how it says here, randomized assignment preserves characteristics. So some of the people or characteristics of the population, so let's say 60-ish percent of the population is male, just because they are. Um, if you randomly assign enough people to treatment and control, then roughly 60% of the treatment group and roughly 60% of the comparison group are also going to be male. It's going to reflect the general population. If you don't randomly assign, and maybe the program works better for males, then they might all self-select into the treatment group, and then you'll have like 90% male in this group and only 10% male in this group. Then you don't have comparable groups anymore. Um, so as long as randomization is done well and at a big enough scale, then you can have good comparable groups here. Um, the way this works with DAG language, again, um, so let's imagine we have some randomized control trial, we want to see what the effect of doing a mosquito net is, or having a mosquito net in your household, what the effect of doing that is on the malaria infection rate in a village. Um, this is from the reading that you did um, from the chapter that um, talks about kind of matching and all of this other stuff. Um, so if you draw a DAG that is just an observational DAG, it might look something like this, um, where mosquito nets cause malaria infection rate, but a whole bunch of other things also cause malaria infection rates and the usage of mosquito nets. Here I just stuck one in here, income. Um, it could be that more wealthier households will use mosquito nets more because they can afford them, and they'll have a lower infection rate in general because they have better access to healthcare, um, they have better housing that keeps mosquitoes out, they can afford mosquito extermination, they can do other stuff. And so income confounds that relationship there. If you can randomize this, and you can have a randomized controlled trial for mosquito nets, what that lets you do with the DAG is you can cut all of the arrows that lead into your treatment node. And all you're left with is the effect of mosquito nets on malaria infection rate, and magically all of the confounding goes away. Um, and so you can just measure the effect directly of mosquito nets on infection rate. Um, and so 
you can do this because the confounders no longer influence treatment. Um, it could be that people with higher income self-select into the program. They're going to go seek out mosquito nets. Um, but if you randomly assign households to this, um, then they're not going to self-select anymore, which means all of that confounding is gone and um, the whole effect that you can find is not influenced by any other confounders. It's just the direct effect of mosquito nets on infection rate, which is what you want ultimately, is that one arrow. Um, and so randomization lets you very easily isolate arrows um, without worrying about back doors, without worrying about front doors, any of the other DAG logic that we've been talking about. RCTs just make it happen. Um, so how do you do this randomization? Um, you saw this fun chart in the World Bank uh, reading that you had. Um, it's basically you go through three different steps to randomize the assignment of some sort of treatment or some sort of program. Um, you look out in the world and you define who the eligible units are. So in this program, it looks like they're trying to do something that's targeting people who don't have cars. So people with cars are ineligible. So you don't want to even offer the program to people who are ineligible because either they'll use it and it won't help them at all, or they'll just refuse it and you'll just have lots of non-uptake. And so you don't want to kind of offer the program to people who can't even use the thing. Um, so you're going to sample from the general population that is eligible for the program and create kind of a smaller sample. But you don't give the program to all of those people. Um, so what you do here, this notice here how it says external validity. As long as you can make it so this this sample that you get for the actual splitting into treatment and control groups, if this reflects the general population, then you can have a stronger case for external validity because whatever you see in the sample will probably apply to the general population. Um, so you want to make sure that's a good sample. Then once you have your sample, you have to divide them into comparison groups or control groups and treatment groups. Um, and this is where you have internal validity. You don't want self-selection into the treatment or the control group. And so, notice how there's a die there. The best way to um, assign people to these groups is through randomization. And there are good and bad ways of randomizing access to, uh, to these programs. Um, you can use something as simple as a coin. Um, you can use dice. Um, you can use an unbiased lottery. Um, you can... Um, there are actual lottery companies out in the world that specialize in making sure that lotteries are done well and cleanly and without any bias in them. So you can partner with one of them if you really want. Um, one thing you can do on your computer is generate a whole bunch of random numbers and then assign some sort of threshold. You can even do this in Excel. Um, there's a function in Excel where if you type equals R-A-N-D and then open and close parentheses in a cell, um, that generates a random number. Um, I think it's just between zero and one. And so you can drag a whole column down with a whole bunch of random numbers in it. Um, they're tiny, tiny random numbers. But what you can say is if anybody has a value that's greater than 0.5, they're in the program. Anybody with less than 0.5 is out of the program. You can choose whatever threshold you want. If you want the program to only go to 20% of your sample, then you choose a threshold at like 0.8. And say so anybody above 0.8, gets in, anybody below 0.8 gets out. So you choose your threshold and then kind of assign people according to whatever random tiny number they got. Um, so that, that's a good way you can do it on your computer. Um, a final way that actually lots of states and cities use for um, actual lotteries is um, this idea of atmospheric noise and using that to help generate the randomness. The issue with using Excel to randomize data, or any computer program really, to randomize data, is it's not really truly random. It's something called pseudo-random numbers. Um, when you choose a random number in Excel, it doesn't just think it off the top of its head, it bases it on some number that exists and then goes through some algorithm um, that is a predetermined algorithm and then figures out, then spits out the random number. And smart hacker types of people have figured out that algorithm and they can predict which random numbers will appear based on the time of day um, because that's generally kind of the initial number that um, the random number algorithm uses to then choose its random number. It's something called a seed, um, the initial starting number. And so if, 
if you can kind of guess the seed or guess the whole process, you can guess the final number. And so people have been able to predict um, lotteries that are based on Excel. You can guess the numbers because you can figure out the algorithm, which isn't great. Um, so there's this fun website here, random.org. If you check them out, what they do is instead of um, just using like a clock or a, a random number of milliseconds during a day or something for their random seed. They have a telescope pointed somewhere at the sky and it measures the amount of atmospheric noise and rays of the sun and stuff that cross the telescope. And it uses that to then um, start the random the random algorithms um, and then spits out a random number based on that noise. That's not hackable. Um, and that's totally almost purely random. Um, and they advertise themselves as that. They actually work with states and other governments to, to provide kind of perfect randomness. Um, and so they're kind of a fun thing to do. They have an app. Um, whenever I have to like choose random numbers, um, I use them because why not? Um, even when I have to choose like a random seed, um, as you've seen in some of the, the past R code, and whenever you have something that is, that is based on randomness, um, and you want it to stay random, the, stay the same randomness every time. Like if you're trying to, to uh, lay out the different nodes in a DAG, every time you're going to plot that DAG, it's going to be different. And so what we did in the code is we said set seed, and then I just typed one, two, three, four. That just made it, that was the initial number for the random positioning. And now every time that runs, it's going to use the same positioning because it starts with that same seed that then goes into R's algorithm for determining a random number. Um, so what I do in real life when I'm doing anything with randomness, I go to random.org, generate a number there, and then use that as my seed in R, and it feels super official. Nobody's going to hack my code. Nobody cares about like predicting my regression results, but it still feels really cool and hackery to, to just pick up atmospheric random noise. So do that. That could be fun. Um, you can do the same random threshold thing here, generate a list of like, um, 200 numbers if you have 200 participants and then just choose a threshold and then assign according to the threshold. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. So check that out. It's fun. Um, so how many people should you include in your sample? Um, it determined or it depends on how big of a sample size you, or a, how big of an effect you want to be able to find. We talked about this last time when we talked about statistical conclusion validity in session six, where the size of the sample you select determines how easily you'll be able to detect a real effect if there is none. Um, and so if you imagine this, this is the same example we saw last session. Um, let's say there's some training program that, that causes your income to rise by $40. So we can measure people before and after. We have a treatment group, we have a control group, it was randomly assigned, hooray. Um, if we then, if we only have like 10 people in the program, um, we'll measure a difference. That's the red line here. That's about $40 of an increase in income. But because we don't have a ton of people in the study, um, we have no way of knowing if that is correct. If we shuffle all of the numbers and do that like 10,000 times and simulate a world where there is no difference between the treatment and control groups, um, we could see differences up to $200, as low as negative $200. And so seeing $40 in this hypothetical world where there's no difference is completely normal. There's an 89% chance that we would see a difference of $40 in this, in this world where there's no effect. That's only because we chose a very, very small sample size. And so the variation in possible outcomes is huge. If we have a bigger sample size, um, like 200 here, um, we might see a result of $40. Um, but in the world where there's no difference, because we have a lot more people, that world is a lot smaller now. And so now it ranges between negative 20 and 20. Um, and so seeing a $40 difference is fairly rare. The probability of seeing that is less than 0.001. Um, and so now we can say that's probably an actual effect that we can measure in the population. This doesn't mean there's no effect over here. This just means we can't detect the effect. That might be a real effect there, but we can't tell if it fits or if this null world, um, like it's too big of a null world to actually recognize the $40 difference. So the more people you have in your sample, um, the easier it is to detect effects that aren't part of this world where it doesn't exist. 
Um, and so the guidance that I gave you last time was um, go to Google and search for statistical power calculator, and it will tell you how many people should be in your sample, um, depending on the size of the effect that you're hoping to find, um, how much variation you think that effect has in, in your general population to see how hard it might be to detect it. And you plug in a whole bunch of other numbers, and then it spits out a number that should be your sample size in order to find the effect. So always do that when you're trying to plan kind of an experiment. Um, when you're Before you collect data, make sure you're collecting enough so that you can actually measure effects. So you're not measuring true effects. That red line is right. But there's, you can't tell if that's right because there's not enough data to, to be able to see if that's outside of a world where there's no effect. So sample size really matters. Um, and randomization allows you to do this to find these effects as long as you have enough samples. So make sure you always do that.